So at this point, we got a few minutes left before we all wrap up. Um, I would like to uh, encourage uh, Jane and Pamela to come up here. Usually we have a few minutes left and kind of have built in some time for a little round table, you know, surprise question and answer moment. Uh, stump the professor, if you will. So we got a, a wonderful opportunity to have access to these folks and to, to get other kinds of strategies we can try to use to, to build more of those bridges between the two moving trains there. So I'm going to turn it over to, to you guys to wreak havoc. I have two questions. The first is about prognosis. So I feel like maybe patients aren't hearing it, but I suspect maybe it's not being talked about either among their care teams. That they're very surprised to hear that they have a life-limiting illness, even if they're in stage <coughs> And then my second question is about um, if there are in Portland exercise programs or certain ideal activities that are good for people in more advanced stages, um, because I know a lot of people don't qualify for cardiac rehab until their dextro fraction is very low. So I can answer, I'll answer the second one first because it's the easiest. <laughs> there are exercise programs. What we do for our HEFPEF, um, uh, Medicare actually will pay for, if you have an EF less than 35%, you have a one-time benefit of 36 visits to cardiac rehab. So that one is a shoe in If your patient has heart failure with reduced and a low EF, you, you can go ahead and uh, prescribe that. And they have mindfulness training. They have all kinds of stress management. It's a great program. For the HEF-PEF, we usually send that patient to physical therapy for strength and um, exercise training because remember HEF-PEF, one of the ways you're going to take care of it is you're, you want that patient not to be sitting all the time. So for those patients, we order um, physical therapy and we appoint, we write under the comments section for OHSU, please appoint cardiac exercise uh, specialist. So that, that's sort of our way around it. I was just at a consortium uh, yesterday and uh, a lot of the other places are doing um, pulmonary rehab for their COPD HEFPEF patients, but they're thinking of however they can get that patient in, but you're right, you, you, do, need, you do need to exercise that patient because nobody's getting better just sitting in a chair. Um, it, as far as the goals of care discussion, I think we can both talk about this. Um, we do tell the patients, I mean, we tell them all the time, and that's why now we're adding in a one year, uh, an annual visit to where we go over goals of care. And part of that will look like, here's the trajectory, here's where we think you are, what are our goals? So that's like, that's the place that we wanna be. It doesn't happen consistently. Patients, oftentimes, I've had patients that I've taken care of for years, who all of a sudden will say to you, well, nobody ever told me that and you're like okay so like here's the deal I've told you that like 60 times but the thing is they weren't in a place that they could hear it so it's all about always delivering the message trying to say it in a different way having family members uh, be there having the patient say back to you like so I don't I want to make sure you understand what we're talking about like I want to make I always say I want to make sure I didn't mess up or mess you up and I want you to tell me what you think the prognosis is. So that we do try to do that with everybody, but you're sort of, if you think about it, one person will come in the room and say to the patient, you're doing great. Well, okay, so then none of that stuff counted that Jane told me about before. That's what happens to people. Mm -hmm. I, I had an ICU nurse tell me that a 20-some-year-old girl in, in uh, ICU was doing great and she was stable and I said so see here's the problem she's on levofed and she's on you know and she's on dobutamine this is not this is not doing great this is not doing well so um, I think even though we think the patient's doing great right that second it's sometimes we all sort of uh, put that a little bit into um, a a problematic area just by trying to have an encouraging moment. I think this is something that most providers struggle with is just prognostication in and of itself. There's not a lot of great data. There's more data coming out every year and more formulas and things that we can use to help prognosticate mortality, but it's still not a perfect science. And you're talking to somebody about they're going to die at some point. I mean, we're all gonna die at some point, but we're making this a reality for this person. 
And I don't know about you all, but there are some subjects it's difficult for me to hear. It's difficult for me to hear that um, my height and weight might classify me as pre-diabetic and obese. But sometimes we have to hear those hard messages repeatedly before they're really going to sink in. And so that's why it's so important for us on our first visit, what do you understand about how sick you are? What has the doctor told you? What do you expect might happen in the future? Trying to gather that information so we can be reinforcing those messages as we go. So you put this um, heart failure do you give this to all your patients when they go home, and can I steal it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it oh, absolutely. Yes. No, no. It, our awesome. whole Northwest yeah. Heart Failure Consortium, which is um, Oregon and part of Washington, mm -hmm. we all are trying to use the same exact tool, trying to keep it simple. And um, that, I think you have that available. Yeah, when we, we send out our after uh, summary of the email to you, mm -hmm. it'll have electronic versions of that, both in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you can brand it, you can do whatever you want. We all decided a long time ago, this is community property. Yes, yeah. although patients go home with a lot of material, yeah. so sometimes you have to find it and help them understand how important that is. Exactly I, as I was reviewing Mrs. J's chart, I, I want to say that I read at least three different visits where the nurse gave this paperwork to the patient as well as a calendar to write down their weights and then came back for the next visit and nobody knew where those papers were. So that's something to understand too. They're getting stacks of stuff and maybe they have it, we just need to find it. It's in the patient belongings bag, it's in the folder. <laughs> that's why I'm always like, where's your belongings bag? When I go in there, like, oh, here it is, as I'm throwing that, where's your advanced directive? Can I ask yeah. you a question about that? Form. I mean, do you think as far as it being something that would get people to use it more, if there was like a, an app of that, like <coughs> an electronic version that prompted them every day Depends on how to, you to weigh themselves, they would, they, would they use that? Well, not everyone has that literacy. So people, I won't say older people just to separate them, but some people prefer the paper. Yeah, okay. And then some people are more savvy with the phone, so it just depends on the person. There are apps that we have. Um, it, you gotta love, whenever I have a patient that's an engineer, and I'm not meaning it's a stereotype, I'm like, yes, thank you, thank you. Because they come in with the graphs, they come in with the data, they come in with questions about, like, now, do you think the trajectory changed? And I'm like, oh my God. So that's the way it should be. You know, that's great, but that's really not, that's not what I see in my day-to-day -day practice. They. Um, the, the other thing, the app is a great idea. There are plenty of apps that people use. We also have something called Health Harmony. Believe it or not, it was made from, uh, help fund by the guy from eHarmony. Went to Intel and GE, and I have iPads for patients that I will send them home. And it's like 60 days worth of, I ask them questions every day. They remote monitor their blood pressure, their weight, et cetera. The thing about telehealth or tele, um, the remote monitoring the data on that is sort of mixed. So there's really not a lot of studies that support this is gonna work <coughs> for everybody. So what I like to do is I like to figure out which person would that work for. And it's just like you said, you have to figure out where the patient is. Some patients, this is way too much for them. If I have a homeless patient, I don't give them that. I tell them, go to your appointment, take your medicines. That's all you can do. Eat whatever you need to eat, drink whatever you need to drink, but you have to go to your appointments because otherwise you're going to set up the patient, patient to um, not do well, and that's not what we want to do. And I'll add a little bit to that too. Um, I was speaking to a patient after a hospital discharge. Not everyone has the resources. Not everyone is referred to social services. And so some of these patients, they just don't even know when it is they have to call the doctor. So I asked this patient, okay, so when do you know to call your doctor? This patient has COPD and heart failure. So she couldn't tell me when she could call a doctor or, oh, I'm not really quite sure. I don't know how bad I should feel before I call my doctor. So I can see a PD, there's also an action plan like that where it's mm -hmm. like red, yellow, and you know, green. Right, and when that's where it started. Doctor, just like asthma too. It should also be the same in heart failure because when they're in a primary care clinic, sometimes that's their only health resource. They don't, when they go home, they don't have other resources or they don't have 
um, nurses or social worker visiting them. So at that clinic level, that's also their resource to know when they should go to the hospital and when they should seek services so that they don't go home and they're going to the ED when it gets really bad. Right. right. Yeah. And I think that's something to really understand. You know, we are we're essentially giving patients bad news a lot of the time. Your life is changing, you have to change your routines, you have to do these different things. But helping them to understand that the reason why we want you to call your doctor if XYZ changes is because that's an opportunity for us to jump in before things get really bad. Because we know things will, will get really bad and we don't want them to get really bad. We want to help you maintain your health and be as healthy as possible. So trying to change that message for the patient, I'm not calling the doctor because I'm in trouble because I haven't been taking my medications. I'm calling the doctor because my symptoms are worse and I probably need to have something changed within my plan of care. Well, and that's the beauty of that the zone tool is you're like, call the provider, call the provider, because they you, you want to catch it early because yes. then otherwise the, and the patients have a really hard time with that because it means failure yes. in their in their head it means failure and it's not failure I say it, it just means that the recipe that you're on right now is not working I need to change the recipe and I can't change the recipe if you don't call me <coughs> okay so actually first Jane, what do you tell your patients about alcohol <coughs> use so I'm, if the patient comes in for alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy, which is a thing, so those patients are drinking like a fifth a day, and, and if they don't stop, they will die from it. I mean, and it, they won't get better. So it is a toxin. The current recommendation is, is complete abstinence of alcohol, especially if they're a brand new heart failure patient. And I'm trying to do everything I can to make them better. I say to them, you have to stop drinking, period. So after they're established for a while, and the, for those that are farther out on the curve, w we just tell them, you know, we'd rather you not drink, but if you, have, if you have any alcohol, don't have more than one glass of wine or one drink a day. Because it's really when they stack up a couple, like you can see the ones that do the Friday or Saturday night binging, that their weight will go up because it will reduce their ejection fraction because it is a toxin. So, you know, it, life is life and you got to figure out who you're dealing with, but for the alcohol-induced cardiomyopathy, the answer is zero. Zero. And there's no, I can't make that better for them because I'm like, this is a poison. It's clear to me that this is a poison for your heart and you can't have any. So, and if you do drink some, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you worse. So, th sorry. Yeah, so I had a question. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the right side of heart failure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, been a nurse for a while. My understanding was always the right side, left side, but uh, there's the reduced and pres um, preserved. preserved now. Huh. But do they? Is that more just academic now? The right sided, left sided, or no. the preload? So usually, typically, heart failure will be left sided most of the time, right? Because people get short of breath. At some point, and in many patients with comorbidities, they will also have right-sided heart failure. Now, it, Mrs. J that we talked about was never a candidate for a transplant, and nobody, the thing is, when she thought she heard transplant, it's because somebody said the only way that you could possibly do better is with the transplant, and you're not a candidate. Any patient that has a right, a, a big right ventricle, the reason because they, that they have a right ventricle that's so big is because of high pulmonary pressures or something going on. So if you put in a new heart, that right ventricle is also going to fail. If you put in a VAD and you make the left side all of a sudden pump well, that right ventricle, that patient will die actually. So that patient will not do well. So um, the, when you look at right and left sided, uh, it's just really where the fluid's going to dump. And it really doesn't matter if it's heart failure preserved <coughs> or reduced. It's just whichever side it goes. So it's, it's a clue for you to look where is the fluid going to go. And that's basically all that it'll tell you. So, yeah. Yeah. And I actually asked um, my medical director about that question, actually. And he said, basically, we're focusing on the left ventricle because that's where the pumping happens. And it does back up. It backs up to the maybe right, right. side or so. So basically, the pumping or a dejection fraction of the pump, how the heart pumps is the left ventricle. How the heart relaxes is to the left ventricle also. So it's kind of like we're still focusing on the heart. And that's why I would think bypass is so important because with the push of the oh, bypass yeah. is pushing the blood through the And how many of us have patients that have not worn their BiPAP? 
<laughs> Come on, everybody, put your hands up. I know you need, like, oh my goodness, that talk about a cash cow. If somebody could figure out how to make that work, that would be like the best thing in the world. So these patients, I go to their homes, you go to their homes, their BiPAP's dusty. I'm like, okay, like, let, let's look at this for a minute. Like, this needs to work. Yeah. Helping to educate them to understand that the comorbidities are just as dangerous as the heart failure itself. And then I just had one observation, um, especially in Portland, I don't know in other cities, but just with meth being such oh, yeah. a big problem, like there's so much CHF reduced from, from that. So yep. I don't know. High pulmonary pressures. So, so the, the problem with meth is it makes your pulmonary pressure so high. And so then you get the right-sided failure from it. And again, it's a toxin. So we have a lot of um, meth methamphetamine-induced patients. The other thing is the tachycardia that goes with it. It's not gonna help your heart failure either. But really for those meth users, what you'll see is those pulmonary pressures just go just off the charts. And so um, if the patient stops with the meth, oftentimes we'll have them on sildenafil or something like that to reduce those pulmonary pressures. I don't have a tool for ambivalence that I'm aware <coughs> of. Um, I think all of us are ambivalent on various mm -hmm. things, and for our patients, it's we're seeing it because they're having to make these really serious decisions about things that are directly impacting how long they're going to live. And many of them um, didn't learn coping mechanisms growing up, didn't learn how to make peaceful transitions, their life's chaos and so that's how they function um, I, I don't know of a good tool it's it's more of something that I evaluate as I'm talking to them and looking at their behaviors um, are the behaviors that they're the decisions that they're making on a day-to-day -day basis really representative of what they're stating their goals to be and that's the best way I can measure their ambivalence. Maybe motivational interviewing techniques can sometimes Definitely. help. Definitely, mm -hmm. yes. Because that's the core thing of you know, somebody grappling with change. It's not that they don't want to change, it's just they're ambivalent about it and they right. haven't reconciled that, that need for themselves. I mean, it sounds like Miss J, it took her quite a while to really and resolve. Her family you know, what too. do I want versus her, what is my family telling me I want? Right. That's, so, that's and the other place. thing too is I, I know at OHSU we have a psychologist now for our congenital patients and she's just starting to see some of our HFPEF and other heart failure patients. She especially, you can imagine the congenital group is a whole different, you know, told from day one you're not going to make it and I'm still 35 and I just had a kid and you told me not to so there. So um, mm -hmm. and guess what, my kid's doing fine. So, um, so that whole thing, she works with that population. Um, and here's a plug too for the ACC, can I do this, the Oregon, um, on the 28th and 29th of this month, we actually have um, that psychologist, Adrian Kovac, is uh, giving a talk at our annual meeting. So we have a heart failure meeting on Friday, um, followed by the ACC uh, Oregon chapter meeting. And I can send you that link if That'd you want that. That'd be wonderful, thank so, um, you. So that's my little plug, sorry. I'm on that education committee. Plugs are good. Yes, education's <laughs> awesome. What, what is the criteria for a heart transplant in this situation? So they have to have a stable psychosocial situation. And by, by the way, Mrs. J, like 10 years before I ever met her, was uh, turned down by the, by the um, advance team because of non-adherence. <laughs> I was like, well, it's still working for her. She's doing fine. Um, so you have to have a good psychosocial support. They have to go through, they can't have end-stage organ disease. So if I'm a diabetic and I have uh, retinopathy or I have kidney disease or whatever, and you put in a, uh, you transplant me and you have to give me a lot of steroids, guess what, I'm not gonna do well. So you don't want that to happen. Any patient that has right-sided failure is totally out right there. That's it, that's enough. So they have to go through certain criteria. Um, and remember, if you put a transplant in somebody, their tenure 
mortality rate is about like, or at, actually at 10 years out, about 65 to 70 percent of them are still alive. So it is actually the best therapy. But you can't give somebody a heart when you think that they're, you know, if they have substance abuse, et cetera. At um, OHSU, we, every single patient that's uh, discussed <coughs> has to go through a certain process. There's a social worker, a whole team. We discuss the patient. If the patient has history of, say, meth abuse or whatever, because there are quite a few of those, um, we do spot checks. They have to be sober. Um, they, uh, we do nicotine checks. They can't be smoking. And of course, the latest was the patient saying, well, like, pot's legal. Why can't I smoke? Because we're putting a new heart in you, and we don't want you to smoke. So, um, period. <laughs> well, what about edibles? No, it's off the table. So, so the thing is, you have to make sure that the patient is the right candidate because you only have a certain number of hearts, and it, you have to be a good steward of that heart. And I just had one more question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we planted him. <laughs> He's a plant. Do you ever find a correlation with low albumin or doing albumin infusions for that? Or I guess it's just symptom management, but still. So albumin for why, though? Uh, like for clear spacing. So, so really no data that supports that. We do have patients. One of the advanced markers you'll see in your patients as they get sicker, as they fill up with fluid, especially in their liver, they'll stop eating, right? So you'll see their protein and their albumin go, up, go down. And this just means they're, they're basically starving to death. And so every now and then we'll have a patient that in, uh, on 11K that they'll end up giving a, an albumin to before because their albumins are like dangerously low. It really not a common um, therapy for these folks. So what you try to do is you try to get them to eat small frequent meals that are high in protein and you have to address that. But that's, um, has really, it, it's really diuretics are the mainstay of, of treatment for that group. Good question, though. Any other? I think it's about time to release these folks into the wild. Let's give a big hand to all the presenters. Kelly, stand up and take a bow.